Hello, and welcome to the BYU Family History Library webinar series. We're glad you could join us today. I'm Bryant, and I'll be your host for this webinar. Please make sure your microphones and web cameras are disabled during the presentation to provide for a smooth recording. If you have technical difficulties during the webinar, please use the chat box and I can address your concerns. You're welcome to use the chat box during the webinar for comments and insights. However, all questions will be addressed at the end of the presentation. Our next webinar is next week on October 21st, Research Walkthrough Best Practices for Adding a Family from England to Family Tree. And that will be with Catherine Grant at 5.30 p.m. If you would like to access a previous webinar, please visit our webinar index on our website or search on our YouTube channel. All of our webinars are recorded and uploaded by the following Monday for your convenience. We also post links to recordings and on other updates on our Facebook and Twitter accounts. For today's webinar, we are pleased to hear from James Tanner, who will be giving a presentation on improving your genealogical research skills. James has over 35 years experience on genealogical research and is an avid blogger of Geneal Genealogy Star blog and rejoice and be exceedingly glad. He is an author and co-author of over 25 books on genealogical research and has presented at expos and conferences around the US, Canada, and Europe. He served for 10 years as a missionary at the Mesa, Arizona Family Search Library and is currently serving at the BYU Family History Library. James has seven children, 34 grandchildren, and one great-grandchild. We're glad to have James here with us today. And James, if you're ready, we will turn the time over to you. Okay. Howdy, everybody. Um, glad to be back for another webinar here with BYU Family History Library. Uh, just like to mention as we begin that the BYU Family History Library, of course, with uh, the Family History Library in Salt Lake and all of the Family History Centers around the world are basically closed to patrons, except the BYU is open to students and faculty. But uh, as long as we're away from the library itself, uh, the BYU Family History Library missionaries are presently providing uh, a quite a, a large number of services online, one-on-one uh, -on -one support. And uh, we just this last week implemented a help desk from the library itself. That's primarily for students. But you can call or email or uh, however, uh, contact us either individually or through the library and we would be glad to help you on any one of the various different programs one-on-one -on -one, uh, or you can just send an email and we'll come back and, and answer your, your email inquiries. Today we're going to talk about improving your genealogical research skills. Well, okay, everybody like to do that. I need to give some attribution here. Uh, some of the ideas for this presentation come from this book, Genealogical Research by uh, Jones, Eco, and Christensen. And I had the privilege, or have the privilege, Arlene's still alive, I have the privilege of working with Arlene for many years, Arlene Eco, and uh, she uh, has greatly influenced my, uh, my research. And this one book, which I have, which is quite old and is out of print, but you can uh, find a copy on uh, Amazon usually uh, to purchase, is uh, is a treasure. It is really about the best uh, summary of research that I've found any place. So that's why I'm going to use it a little bit, and uh, that's I thought it would be important to let people know that. We're going to start out by my kind of observation is that I would assume that many people's only experience with a research project is writing a research paper in school. And you remember perhaps that you had to do note cards or something, the equivalent of note cards, and you had to, uh, to take a to choose a topic and write a topic, uh, you know, something about that topic. Uh, when I was in high school, I chose to uh, write a, uh, a research paper on uh, the, the Battle of Chattanooga in the middle of, in the, near the, well, two thirds of the way through the Civil War. And, um, that at that time, and which now is kind of like ancient history, um, 
the uh, there was almost nothing available about the Civil War, and it wasn't until the Civil War centennial uh, and uh, all of that happened that that many of the articles, and books, and things that we have today about the Civil War and and uh, were were accumulated. But that was kind of my first uh, research th that uh, I found out that there was actually there were actually ways to uh, to get around the fact that there was very little written. And I found some sources for uh, for writing a paper about that battle, which continues to be one of my interests today. Genealogical research, uh, this is important. It's different from scientific research and it's different from purely historical research. The, the reason is that we are focusing on individuals and, individ and families and the information that we want is usually, a, is usually accumulated around the family. So we have uh, that information. Whereas his, history research in, in a general historic sense looks at broad swaths of history, times, uh, uh, tries to draw conclusions and uh, show patterns and things like that. And scientific research is, is entirely different because scientific research starts out trying to discover an unknown and postulating, doing hypothesis and, and theories, and then uh, trying to figure out ways to prove those hypotheses and theories. Well, unfortunately, and also there's another area of research that's, that's not at all like genealogical research, and that's legal research. There's some similarities, but there's a lot of differences. Now, what are we doing when we're talking about genealogical research? What is it that the, what is our action there? The basic action, which I'll probably repeat at least a couple of times during this presentation, is that we are looking for historical records to provide us with information about our families and our relatives, our ancestors, all of those. So uh, everything about genealogy is, um, is, is based on historical documents. I'll come to that in a minute. But important to understand that learning to do either genealogical or historical research is an acquired skill. No one automatically knows how to do research. And the, the, the research process is something that you learn over a period of time by practicing and doing research over and over again. Uh, you can give the swimming analogy. You could read the rest of your life about how to swim, but unless you got in the water and started trying, you're never going to learn how to swim. Well, the same thing here with, with uh, genealogical research. And that is, you really just have to get in there and try to do it and, and start working on it. Now, fortunately, there are a lot of helps. There's lots of things out there that will help you improve your research skills which will help you to understand the, the, the objectives that you're trying to, to accomplish and also will give you the opportunity to uh, have some success, find things that you otherwise could not find. And it's that process of finding and discovering information and adding to uh, the, the, the body of information that has accumulated about your family that is what's the, you know, one of the driving forces and what people, uh, what you look forward to in, in making some uh, accomplishments here. So here's are the following steps. And these are kind of, uh, of abstract and is, uh, esoteric s steps in a sense. First of all, there is what we call the preliminary survey. And I'll talk more about that. In fact, I'm gonna talk more about each of these steps and explain them in more detail. But sort of the pre part of the uh, preview of what will what I'll say about the preliminary survey is is gathering the information that's already known. So whatever is known about your family and your ancestors is part of this preliminary survey. Then you do what's called a pre-search analysis, and that pre-search analysis involves looking at what has been done, analyzing it to see how accurate and correct it is making, drawing some conclusions about the, the accuracy and then, ex, then formulating the next step, which is to outline the research that you're going to do. That is pick specific areas of your family lines 
that you want to uh, discover, research, do whatever, find out about. The last step is a post search analysis, which means after you've gone, after you've looked at all the records and you've added all the information, you've got to go back, look at it, and then it comes back to the preliminary survey again. You, you still need to keep up to date with what everyone else out there is doing. Okay, so we're going to talk, uh, yeah, resurvey, which means go back and do everything over again. Okay, now on the preliminary survey, uh, when I began doing research many years ago, and now almost 40 years ago, um, that wasn't my initial introduction to research because I had been doing research since I was very young, since high school. And actually, I didn't realize I was doing research, but that's what I did. Anytime I was interested in something, I would go to the library and I would start pulling all the books off the shelf about that subject, and I'd read all those books. So that was uh, uh, kind of the process that I, and I didn't realize then that I would, that was what you would call research. But then now, uh, after many years and after years spent working in libraries and also as a, as a practicing attorney, uh, I've, uh, you know, that was, uh, that's just part of, the, what, of what I do every day is research. Uh, I always am looking up something, checking something, trying to figure out how something works, and also applying that to genealogical research. So, but here with the preliminary survey, the preliminary survey that I did took approximately 15 years. And why that was the case was that I am part of a family line on both sides of my family where extensive research has been done now for well over 100 years, now up to about uh, 120 years of worth of research. And that, that cumulative research uh, was available, was not readily available to me. Now today, that same research process that I spent that took literally 15 plus years of my life would take a matter of maybe a month, maybe less, depending on how much actually has been done in your family. Why is that? Because today we have accumulated and, and created uh, a, a basically the, the online family trees but also the, the major online family tree, which is the familysearch.org family tree, which is collaborative and which has incorporated all of the research that I did over that 15 years, plus all of the other research that's been done and into a, a with billions of names. And so we can basically go there and determine rather quickly what has and what has not yet been done. Now, whatever the other failings or, or your feelings about the family search, family tree are, uh, you need to recognize that it is the now basic source place to go to figure out what work has been done. Um, that doesn't mean you ignore all of the other family trees out there on Ancestry, My Heritage, Find My Past, uh, WikiTree, uh, Genie, all these other big family trees out there because you, you need to be aware of all of that because that is part of this preliminary survey process. So the idea here is to determine what you and your family, family already know and what you do not know. Now that may seem kind of like simple, but when you take that simple statement and apply it to the information that you've been or you have or don't have about your family, you begin to see that that's really the core complexity of, of doing genealogical work. Um, what what really was the challenge for, from my standpoint was that uh, a significant portion of the amount of work that I had that had been done by my predecessors in my family lines was not supported by by sources or was inaccurate or was simply made up or was just simply wrong. So there was just a massive amount of duplication also. Now here, what happens with the, well, why we do the preliminary study? So the question comes up, well, why are we going to do that? Well, because you don't want to have to redo all of the work that's already been done. You know, in other words, in my case, 
it, it's different. But if you find out that no one in your family has ever recorded your genealogy, then you will probably get the impression that you're trying to start out this and you are the only one and you need to do it all. Well, that could be correct for a period of time. But as you get into the big family trees, almost inevitably, uh, you find that we're all interrelated. And as you, you go back in time, you may very well find that a line that you think is really difficult has already been worked on and is in those family trees. So that's why we do a very intensive preliminary survey, because we want to know how far back. Now, the simple way to do that is to, to not try to look at it uh, as a complete project. Set a goal that that says, okay, I want to make sure I get information back on my family for my parents, my grandparents, and my great-grandparents for that first four generations. And if you verify that your first four generations have been done, then you can take a step back to your fifth generation. And you realize, of course, that uh, your every generation you go back doubles the number of people that you're dealing with. So it's 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, you know, whatever. Uh, so 128, 256, on. So that's how many people you have as you go back. But that, and actually, that isn't even correct because you may have multiple marriages. You may have uh, lines where there's adoptions. You may have lines where there are all sorts of issues going out there. And the number of your uh, potential ancestors on all of your lines may be much more than the simple geometric doubling in every generation. So it's very important that you take it in bits. And as you look at, for example, looking at the family search family tree, if you're looking at the family search family tree and you see that all it seems like all the work's done, so you look back there and, and say it's all done. Well, if you do what I did and what uh, our family did, meaning my wife, I, and my children and their spouses have become involved in, you will find out very quickly that uh, that there are a lot more work that needs to be done to verify that information than you than may first appear. Uh, we have now spent uh, collectively many many years of work on the family search family tree and have verified into all all of the individuals into the sixth generation, but it's still not into the seventh generation. The numbers just get very large and the time frame makes a lot of difference. But rather than, than finding out after you've spent, you know, many days doing some research that you're not really sure about, that someone else has already done it, it's a good idea to be aware of all these other family trees out there and get them involved. So in today's world, and summarize, the preliminary survey includes careful research into entire online trees. So basically, we're going to be looking at every one of these online trees. And fortunately, uh, they're all they're pretty accessible. Some of them have paywalls. Some of them you may have to subscribe to to get that information. But it's certainly worth the subscription cost not to have all of a sudden find out that someone has done that work that you just spent a year trying to do. So you really need to, to look at it realistically as a, as a time benefit. In other words, when I subscribe to a number of different websites out there, I do that understanding that, that I am going to benefit from that and not having to spend the time going to libraries or digging out and finding that information in some other source. So that's that's sort of the, the trade-off that there is out there. And before you start any new research, you need to verify that you have that there has been sufficient research done and that it's believable, supported by sources, and can that you can verify that information on any line that you decide to pick up on. Uh, we have out there in the, in the world of genealogy, we have a, a way of showing pedigrees that is called the fan chart. And the fan chart 
is uh, very seductive before, because what it does is it shows you uh, information back on your, on your family lines, and then there are empty spots. And those empty spots, you think, oh, now that's where I should go to get some information. Now they haven't, you know, that's, that needs to be found. That's, that's empty. Well, in most cases, the, the fact that you have a, a fan chart with, with a number of generations on it and there are blank spaces probably means that those people that are, that are in those, that would, should be in those locations are very, very difficult to find because all of the people who have done the work before you have not found those people. So before you jump in and, and look at a blank spot on a pedigree, on a either pedigree chart or on a fan chart, be sure that you work your way back through the pedigree and make sure that you're convinced that every generation has been, uh, been identified. And the question you're asking is, is there specific information on a record or document that shows who this person's parents were? So we can't jump back to the next generation, even if it looks like, oh, this guy's got to, this has got to be this person's parents because the names and the children are all the same and all this and this and this. But in the absence of a document that actually shows that connection, you're, you're really just guessing. And that guess could be wrong. And so you just don't want to start off. I've had people come to me after years of doing research. I've, this, is, this is kind of a summary of some of the, the, the people who come and they say things like this. They say, well, Brother Tanner, um, I guess what? And I go, yeah, I probably guess, but tell me anyway. But then they say, oh, I have been doing research for 35 years. I'm just pulling that number out of my head. and. I have all of this line done, and guess what I found? I found that I've been researching the wrong line. Well, the most, the most recent one of those came about as a result of a DNA test because the person who had done that 35 years of research found out that she wasn't related to her parents when she took a DNA test, that she was adopted, and she had no knowledge of that at all and had done the research for her adopted parents all those years. And she felt terrible because she was now not young and was basically feeling uh, compelled to start over again. Now, I looked at that as a great, a great advantage because uh, nothing like that's happened to me. And I'm, I'm, I'm back where everything is hard. There is no step back that doesn't turn out to be uh, what I call a fire swamp just terrible. Okay. Avoid this unnecessary duplication. Do not think about it. Think, I don't want to do this over. I don't want to spend the time doing the job if someone else has already done it in a way that's adequate, usable, reasonable, verifiable, and can, that I can rely on. So we also need to look for some other things. And first of all, we've got to be out there besides looking just on the line, uh, on your first line online sources, all of those family tree programs that I mentioned a moment ago, and all of their resources, that's, that's one way to do research. But we have to also remember that there's a lot of things out there that aren't online that we have that may solve a particular problem for us or, and that we need to search that aren't in those, those major programs. Uh, many times people come to me and they say, well, I, there's nothing, I can't find any records on family search. And I go, well, how about ancestry? Well, I'm, I've never been on ancestry. Well, okay, so what I'm trying to say is that we move beyond looking at just the normal records that we would think, automatically think of as genealogists to start at and to go through. And probably the one that's, uh, that's, that's elu elusive, and I listed the most elusive one first is family Bibles. But for many years in Western Europe, uh, people recorded their, their immediate families and their genealogy in family Bibles. And many of these Bibles have found their, ways, their way into 
uh, repositories and archives and libraries and uh, and other and, and uh, genealogical societies and historical societies and uh, and, a, and a significant number of them have been digitized and put into some of the programs online but they're not necessarily all in any one of the big programs. They're not in all in family search. They're not all in ancestry. They're not all in my heritage, et cetera. So basically what you're going to do is have to keep looking. And that's always out there. That's the elusive kind of, of record that you may or may never, you may never see one, but you may also find one. I had, a, I was doing research for a friend and uh, it was a family Bible that I found in um, uh, Alabama on uh, that had just someone had just copied and put on as an attachment to uh, to a pedigree on uh, on family sir oh, no, on an ancestry and that image of the family bible was what got me past the 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 step the hard step and connected that family from mississippi to alabama then to georgia and then to south and north carolina where it finally ended so We've got to look for that previously done research. We really get to know whether or not someone else has, has already, you know, plowed this field and harvested the crop and we're just uh, waiting to see if that actually happens. We also want to look at any at letters, journals, diaries, daytimers, anything we can find from our family. This is all part of the preliminary um, uh, survey. So we've got to look out there and see everything that the family's gotten. Um, and, and one thing, you the consequence of this, of course, is when your family finds out you're interested in it, then they give it all to you. And so then you have this piles, these piles of records and things to deal with. Uh, so be aware that that's probably gonna happen. If it doesn't happen, then you're not asking enough questions. So let's start asking everybody for that. Be sure and contact your older relatives and, and record their memories. Uh, Every one of us who gets to the age that I'm at uh, feels terrible that they didn't record more of what was out there. I started when I was very young recording my grandparents, but I actually had contact with my great grandmother and I never did record her. Fortunately, she wrote a lot of extensive of, of her history extensively. She was the genealogist. And so I have all of her work and uh, that was helpful. And my other great-grandmother died when I was very young. And so that another, another great-grandmother died when I was very young. The other ones I never knew at all. Okay, also check with local historical societies, libraries, where your family lived. Uh, they may have records. Um, if I go back to the small town in Arizona where, where my grandparents and most of my great-grandparents lived, uh, in eastern Arizona called St. John's in Apache County, then the this historical society there and the libraries there all have photos of my family, all have information about my relatives because they were, they lived there and the towns weren't, the town wasn't that big. So almost everybody in the town is recorded somewhere in those historical records that are in the in the libraries. And so that's, and, and I walk into the library in, Saint, in the, uh, the local uh, museum, historical museum in, in St. John's, and there on the wall is a picture of my great grandfather in front of his blacksmith shop. So, you know, this is the kind of thing that we need to know about. We need to know where that information is. The other one that's helpful is to look for photographs. Ask people if they have any photographs and any of your relatives. And from those, and then ask if you can copy them uh, if they want the originals back. In some cases, many cases with my family, they just gave me the photographs. And so I ended up with thousands. In one case, my great grandmother was a professional photographer and I ended up with uh, about 4,300 uh, photographs and negatives that she had created, even, even glass negatives back to the old photography methods. And uh, that collection ended up at the University of Arizona, where I uh, went after I had uh, digitized every one of the pictures and documents and, and uh, then I supplied and donated it to the University of Arizona a lot. And it's online, you can go look it up. 
So that's important. Um, and we want to also look at every other document, certificate, and record that you can possibly find. So this is the this is the survey. Um, back in the back many years ago in genealogy, they used to say get a box and put all your documents in it, and then start from there. Well, today I'd say your box is your computer, and I would get the get on the computer and find out what other people have done to start with. If you can't find anything at all then start talking and getting your relatives. If you can't find anything information, if you, for example, do not know who your parents are, which can happen, and I've talked to lots of people who had that problem, or that challenge, I'll call it not a problem, but um, that challenge, get a DNA test and, uh, and do two or three. Go get one from Ancestry, get one from My Heritage, get one from 23andMe, put them all together and, and upload them all to all these programs and work on uh, My Heritage and Ancestry uh, and see how many relatives you get. Uh, because we've done <clears throat> a lot of research and because uh, my families, the families I'm part of are extraordinarily large, I have probably got 10,000 DNA matches on Ancestry and at least that many, ten, another 10,000 on my heritage. So there's no, no lack of people out there that I'm related to. But if you're in the situation where you're, you don't know your parents or you, you, you don't know who your grandparents are, then getting a DNA test will, will help you to get past that. So all of this is part of the survey. I, and I would, I would consider a DNA test initially to be a part of your initial survey. Here's the here's the key. The key to to sanity and genealogy is don't believe everything you find. You're out there in this kind of dark and murky wood of history and you're going to find absolutely people have absolutely said that these are the parents of this person and they are absolutely correct and they know that that's true except for the very simple fact that they have no documentation showing an actual connection. They just believe it's true, or they have inherited it from their parents or their grandparents or whoever that this was the case. And that's just not, you know, that's the biggest trap. That's one of the big traps. There's many big traps, but that's one of the biggest traps out there. And also important to understand that the survey is never complete you're still out there trying to determine who's done what and whether it's correct or not. And so, but with the tools that we have through these large websites and these multiple family trees, then, and by the way, let me mention this so there's no, no misunderstanding. We're saying, yes, we have our family tree on all these different programs. Why? Because then that gives us the advantage of the contacts and the sources that come from their record hints and their record matches to our family tree. So it's, it's never complete. We'll always find out that someone else has done more work. Now, the pre-search analysis is, is really kind of where you pause. I mean, assuming that, the, that the, the survey keeps going on and on in the background, at some point you actually sit down and start working through all of these records and all of this information so that you can determine whether or not uh, what your level of confidence is in the, in the information that's been, been uh, acquired. Now, uh, the, basically you have to overcome this, this um, constant uh, idea that because somebody else did it and, it and wrote it down that it's correct, it's not necessarily true. So we have to go on from there. So now what you have to do is review all the information you have and make sure that you record all of the information on a family tree program or website. Now there's lots of choices. You can choose a desktop program like Roots Magic or Ancestral Quest or there's a nice, really nice new one from, from France called Eradis. It's Heredis, H-E-R-E-D-I-S in English. I don't know what how they say they say at ease, but anyway, um, there's some French programs. There are for 
if you you know have family happens to be from France, that's a great advantage. And there are lots of other programs. There's Family Tree uh, Builder from My Heritage, which is free, uh, and can and works on your desktop. So you can choose that if you want that level, but but there is also an advantage to having your information on the family search family tree because of the collaborative nature and the fact that you're gonna have so many people out there looking at it. Most of the people look at that as being a disadvantage. They're afraid of having people look at their information because they might change it. Well, yeah, but they might change it to be correct and you might have it wrong. And to think it's always wrong when you make a change is, well, it's a little bit over stated you know that you think you you're right and they're all wrong that's not going to happen okay so you have to choose and in my case um i i really uh, rely heavily on family search but i also rely heavily on ancestry and my heritage because both of those pro programs are extremely valuable in helping me and i also use fan my uh, uh find my past many times because it's an English, primarily British island island program. And um, it is basically helpful because I have a, a substantial number of English ancestors and also Scottish, Irish, and Welsh ancestors. So having that program is helpful. And I've lately been looking at uh, very heavily and I subscribe to American ancestors which is a, uh, a program that deals primarily with New England. And it's been providing me with, with tr ex exceptionally good information that I did not have access to previously. So it's broadening your scope out there and using a lot of different sources. Uh, but decide on your primary one. Which one are you going to focus on primarily for the information that you've got? So then you go through and you examine and confirm all the places you see in your survey. You'll notice the word there, the operative word here is places, because that's what tells you whether or not you have consistently correct information. Now, how does that work? Well, for example, the most common example happens, it happens in the United States almost as much as it does any place else. But it's easier to see in England, especially if the people who are doing the research live in the United States and haven't and don't have a lot of uh, background in England. If I say, if I see a family in the, uh, and I'm back in the early 1800s or even into the 1700s, and I see a family with children, with say six children, and three of the children are born in Lancashire, and the other three children are born in Middlesex counties in England. How? What's the chances that that's correct information? Now, the problem I, that I run into constantly is that if you live here in the United States, the words Lancashire and Middlesex don't mean anything to you. you you're not doing it. But what if I said this, let's say we're back in the early early 1700s in, in the, on the east coast of the United States, and I say that this family had six children and three of the children were born in Maine and three of the children were born in Georgia. Well, then you would be able, then you would really be suspect because you'd realize the distance between those two places back at that early years almost prohibited. There were no roads, and there was no way to get travel there without it, a tremendous expense. And, and we get to the first rule of genealogy, which is that when the baby was born, the mother was there. So the mother had to be in Georgia and in Maine to have those babies. And how did the mother travel? So once you can start looking at, at uh, uh, the, at, from the places. Now, the book that I referenced at the beginning of this was called Genealogical Re Research, a Jurisdictional Report. The word jurisdictional could be substituted for places. And that's really why that book is important because it looks at genealogy from on the basis of where the events in, the, in your ancestors' lives occurred. And so once you know that, um, then it's important. So the more the most important 
function of anything when you're looking at analyzing whether the information is correct. The dates, yeah, dates can be approximate. Names, names change from all over the place. They're, they're and they're spelled and people didn't even spell their name correctly. They changed their names. They did all sorts of things. Okay, so there's no correction there. They spelled their name different ways because they didn't, that wasn't the way we, there was no standard way to do it. So the only thing that actually is the, is the firm anchor for doing research in genealogy is location, location, location. Unless you are looking at very, very critically at all of the locations that show up in your genealogical information, you're probably off on a tangent someplace because you've probably picked up some names where the names were exactly the same, the birth dates look like they match, and the children all are right, and everything's the same. And I can assure you that if you get into some areas like in England and any place in Scandinavia, Denmark, Sweden, Norway, Finland, any of those countries, and you don't realize that the only thing you're going to be able to differentiate these people is through their location, the, the actual house that they lived in as opposed to everyone else in the community who had the same name with the same wife's name and the same children's names, then you're, you're gonna get lost here as you move out, move back in time. So now what you're trying to do is choose a place to start where you're actually gonna do research. You're not just out there copying what everybody else has done. And by the way, copying is without thinking about what you're copying is, is not really a good idea, but uh, my idea of copying was to go to the Family History Library in Salt Lake City when I was starting out and pull all of the family groups records that I've had for the, that have been submitted for my family over the years from the uh, from the contributed family group records and I spent a huge amount of money on copies up there at 25 cents a copy so I basically accumulated a stack of paper about three and a half to four feet tall. That was what I ended up with when I got all the way through. And then my next step was to take all that and start putting it into the very uh, rudimentary programs that I had back then and migrate it from program to program to program to where I am today. So what I have on my computer today is accumulation of all of those records back there. And by the way, there are a lot of things wrong with it. And I uh, spent the rest of, I've spent most of the rest of my life correcting that information and trying to extend it past the point at which the other people were, uh, had either guessed wrong or had given up on finding any more information. And yes, there is more and more, more information available today, obviously than there was back at those, those time periods. So uh, yes, we can be more accurate. Yes, we can have, we have more information and more records. The biggest, pr most common ongoing genealogical activity, the thing that you're really involved in when you're doing genealogical research is finding the records that are available. First, you have to learn that a record like that exists and then you have to find that record on some location, whether it's in an archive, in a library, or online in one of the big database programs. Okay, let me give you a quick example of that. For, for example, um, we realize that in the United States, we've had a number of wars. Uh, we also, if we think about that, and we know anything about history, which by the way is another basic activity of genealogists is to learn about the history of everything, including all the places where your ancestor lived, the ancestors lived, not just the history of the government, but the history of the individual communities that they lived in, which by the way, are fairly common, uh, at least going back to colonial times in the United States, what's everything that was now in the United States, uh, you can find local histories. So you, there's lots of information out there that gives you an idea of how your people lived. 
records, but learning about where the records are. For example, okay, we have World War One and we have World War Two. What are records that are most? What are some of the most uh, interesting from the family standpoint records that you can find for World War One and World War Two? Well, if you're a genealogist and you've been doing research, the first thing that comes to mind are uh, draft registration records. So when they registered for the draft, each of the primarily males, obviously, they um, they filled out a, a form that told who they were, when they were born, where they were born, and if they were married, and the name of their spouse, and uh, they had a physical description of them. So these draft registration cards. So the question here is, where are the draft registration cards? Well, fortunately, uh, they're on uh, Family Search. They're on Ancestry. They're on um, My Heritage. They're just a, they're one of the common records that are available out there. So they're but they're a very important record that uh, I seldom see attached to people that were actually that that lived through those wars and had an obligation, at least all the males had an obligation to register and fill out one of those forms. So one of the useful things that I used, uh, and it's still useful, but there's some kind of mechanical online ways to, to take advantage of this, is to use a genealogy source checklist. Now, if you go online and search for that, you're gonna find a, a number of them out there online. Uh, and they're they're helpful because you can look at this and and come up with more ideas. Now this particular list it was commonly used in uh, Family History Library up in Salt Lake for many years, and they've gotten away from it because they're now working online, and of course no one needs to look at these old paper things anymore. But this kind of information is very important. And there's a couple of places you can go to get that same kind of information. That means telling you additional sources and places that you can look for information about your ancestors is through uh, the Family History Guide. Uh, the Family History Guide is a free, uh, oh, back, I've got to go back. Okay, the Family History Guide is a free learning research and training activity and it's thefhguide.com. And under there, un, up there under countries, there's a tab there where all, all of the major countries of the world with genealogical records are in detail organized by record set. And so you can begin to see there immediately what records are available in the countries and what we're, and with links out to the actual record sets. The records aren't on the Family History Guide, but the way to get there is. So this is the kind of place where you can save a lot of time, a lot of effort, if you just go to the fhguide.com and look under the countries tab up there. Now, if you need to know how to run, learn about Family Search, Ancestry, My Heritage, Find My Past, then the instructions for those programs are also on this website, free. It is the Family Search uh, Education Training Partner. Uh, this is how I got to it. I read a book I when I was kind of getting in over my head with all of the information I was developing. I had no idea what I was doing, actually. I, I knew you filled out pedigree charts and you did all that kind of stuff, but I really had no idea about records or record sets. This is something you have to learn. And I sat down, I got this book, the predecessor, this is the fourth edition, I happen to have the third edition. And I sat down and read this book by Val Greenwood, The Researcher's Guide to American Genealogy. When I got through with that book, I went, oh, oh, now I know what I'm supposed to be doing. Now I understand where all these, what, what all these records are. Oh, I've got a lot of work to do. So it was kind of a, 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 an eye opener. It was more than an eye opener, it was, a, it was a deal changer. It basically changed and reoriented me towards actually what I was doing. Because before that time, back in those days, I had zero contact with genealogists. I didn't even know another genealogist. 
I ran into one of my old schoolmates once in the family history library who was who told me he was a professional genealogist. That was the first time I even knew that there were professional genealogists. I had never been to a, a genealogy convention or conference or class or anything because I didn't know they existed. And they probably didn't mostly. But now there's all these extra things that we have to help us. Now, once you've done your search, you've got to analyze what you've got. It's not, it's not like you're through. Uh, you've recorded it, you have it in your family tree, and then you find out, oh dear, I made a mistake there. That's not right. He's not the right person. I just found more information. So there's this ongoing process of analyzing and making sure that everything that you have put in your, in your various books uh, records that you've created is consistent, verifiable, and is able, and you're able to reproduce the same, same effect. Now, if you have it on the family search family tree, you're also going to have to defend it a little bit because there's going to be people out there making changes and adding things, and you watch everything out there, and then you uh, react to what they've watched. But you may find out that their changes are more reasonable than you could imagine, that you are the one that needs to learn where this information is, not them. So that's kind of where this, the playing field is, where you can get actually involved on a personal basis. So carefully analyze and record all the information in the records and documents you discover. You'd be surprised, you wouldn't be surprised but you should be surprised to find out as i do constantly on the family search family tree i'll look at a, a birth date for example that's recorded for an individual and then i'll go down and look at every one of the sources and i'll find out there's a birth record that says when they were born but it isn't the date that they, somebody put into the family tree so i have to go in there and, and edit that and put in the record and say look at the birth record which is attached to this person and so that's kind of information. You have to be consistent that you actually record and update your information so you're not, because you, you're, first of all, you'll forget what you've done. And you also need to remember to, to, to uh, continue to verify everything that you do continually. Okay. One of the things you need to recognize, though, is that research is nonlinear. You're going to find a record, and that's going to get you started looking for this person. And then you're going to find another record, and it's going to move over to another family or another person. Or you'll think, oh, wait, I just found a neat record over here. It's not like you're, you're, you're following one track forever. And if you do that, you're basically going to be losing a lot of time and a lot of effort. What you do is you look at the records that you have and then you think, well, I really ought to get all the other information out of these records that pertain to the family. And you look at a census record and you find out that, that it's a small area and half the people are a significant number of people on that one census record, not just the record, individual record where your family is, but the record for that entire community the community record it contains a significant amount of additional information about your family. So research goes out non-linearly. And that's really what the internet gives to us. It gives us the ability to stop, look up a place on, on Google Maps to figure out if this is reasonable, could the mother have been born here and the baby born over here. And all of that information can be determined in a nonlinear fashion. We're not just keep following a step by step by step. Although that's kind of the way that everybody thinks it should be done. It isn't really the way it works. And then think about what you're doing. Don't go jumping to conclusions. Don't jump out there in the air and find out that you've started to do research on somebody and the person that you're considering to be the child really wasn't the child, that there wasn't any evidence that that person was in the family at all. So just be really careful that, that you don't jump out there and conclude something without having some concrete. Another thing that's important kind of as a side note is don't rely on some authority in the past, just because your grandmother, your aunt, 
or a professional genealogist that they hired back and when every year uh, came to the conclusion that this was correct, that doesn't mean that you don't need to go through and verify it and do the research. It's not that you're com not that you not that you're going to duplicate the research that was be done, but you're going to analyze that research to see whether it was correct when they started it, if it makes sense. If it doesn't make sense, it's not correct. Now you go back and start it over again with a survey. You know, you can drive a lot of miles out there on before you, and then find out you've got to drive all that way again. So that's kind of the way that it works with genealogy. Now, from the standpoint of a person like me, I, that's, that's what keeps me going is because A, it's very difficult and B, it's always a challenge and I never run out of work to do. And, and I could get up every day and if I sit there and think about it, I will think of a lot of a huge number of things that I need to keep doing. So it gives you a, a you know, a goal and a purpose and it's something that that helps you to 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 be grounded in in what what reality in your family and remember the rules of genealogy i'm going to flash these up on the screen but if you haven't if you haven't gone through i just told you the first rule it's when the baby was born the mother was there but uh, all of these rules have been developed uh, over my lifetime and uh, i have written extensively on the whole set if you go out there and look for rules of genealogy and put my name, James Tanner, after it, then you'll pull up some uh, blog posts that go into each of these rules and explains why this rule exists and what we're trying to talk about. But the important thing is to never stop questioning. That's a, sort of a quote from Einstein, so that's why his picture is there. And that's really this the, another core uh, part of doing research is you never really believe all those records. You're really always saying, eh, I don't know if that's correct or not. And once you're to that point, then, you know, you may have to go back through it again and again to verify it for yourself. So make sure you have a source for every conclusion. Make sure you find a record that that actually tells you that this, these two people are related and not try to make it up and don't just guess. That's what we're talking about, jumping for, to conclusions that don't exist. And never stop learning. There's always more to learn. There's always another thing to learn. I have started lately a project to read through. I've collect, Over the years, I've collected a, a substantial library of, of uh, books on genealogy written for the last hundred years or so. And uh, I've been going through them systematically and uh, trying to determine, uh, you know, whether this is any help to me. So I'm trying to accumulate all of the, the different ways that people have put forth genealogy over time. Okay, well, that's about it. And we'll turn this back over to Bryant for any questions that anybody happens to have put in the chat. Awesome, thanks James. It looks like we have a couple questions in the chat box. Um, Wilbur asks, name of, book, of the book and authors? And Kevin might have posted that in the, um, a link to that in the chat. Yeah, it looks like he posted a link. So thank you for posting that link to that book in the chat box, Kevin. Um, we have another question and it says, I see it says share content. What does that mean? Well, okay. So some people out there, uh, want to, um, who believe something, I don't know where it comes from, but they think that your genealogy is private. For some reason you, you are afraid that somebody's going to learn about who your relatives are, uh, or you're going to, because you're related to all these people or, uh, what is it? Uh, first of all, the basic rule, legal rule, is that the dead people don't have any privacy. So that's that's a, that's a, a a legal rule in the United States, and probably every someplace. Now that's not all completely true because there are some things that are 
you know, that have some restrictions. But privacy as such is not something dead people have. And so why are we putting up our trees as private trees? Why are we afraid to put our information into the family search family tree because other people might see it? Um, you know, uh, there's so many people out there that think they're going to benefit somehow economically, uh, make it rich because they've discovered all this information about their family. Believe me, most of the people who publish big books on genealogy never recoup the cost of publishing the books. Uh, and I can testify to that because I have about five boxes of books in my basement, not that I published, but that my relatives have published, that people will, yeah, yeah, in a lot of cases, I can't even give them away. People just don't want them. So, you know, it's, it's it, the idea of, of, of putting your, your stuff out there is the only, only way you're actually going to keep from doing just a tremendous amount of duplicate work. Okay, answer to that. Great. You can, you can tell I somehow feel a little bit, you know, strongly about that. <laughs> yeah. And Colby asks, where do you record your information? I think I may have, I may not have said that plainly enough. I use a number of programs. I use Family Search Family Tree as my core program. I use, with that, I use Ancestry and My Heritage as my core programs for recording information. Not that I don't use the other programs for putting my family tree in simply for the purpose of harvesting information. But those are the programs that I use to try to keep the information correct and updated. And uh, then I have Roots Magic. I have my basic backup file on Roots Magic. If I ever, if the world ever ended, I would still have that. And I have it on Ancestral Quest. And, you know, there's a few other places, but somewhere along that line, you have to decide which of the programs you like the best. And that's the one you're going to put everything in um, eventually. Okay. So that's kind of the, the way it works. Um, and it's simple because I happen to be a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And because I'm involved in doing uh, the ordinance work for the, my ancestors in the temples of the church, then uh, I need eventually to get all the information into Family Search if I want to do that. Awesome. And Michael asks, "What's the proper way to know when someone's first name changes, and also when, and also when there are multiple marriages?" Um, most of the programs, every program that I'm aware of, will allow you to to put in as many marriages as the people have. I had an uncle who was had. I think eight wives, but I, I'm aware of four of them or five of them. Um, and I heard that's what I've heard. But yes, the like Family Search, all of those programs will allow you to add in multiple marriages. You can just add a spouse and keep adding families to, uh, to any marriage. And then as far as name changes are concerned, uh, the, the rule for genealogy is that uh, we use the name as it is given in the earliest record we have of that individual. So if the earliest record is a death record, then we use the name in the death record uh, the way it is. Any variations on that we record in other information about the individual notes or whatever you want to call it. But we try to, to use the basic name there. Um, but we do record all the different variations if there is any kind of significance in that. So, but spelling variations are, uh, it, that's just a, that's just a, a problem of the, of, of recording the way it was recorded, uh, especially with census records. The census people wrote down what they heard. They never, they didn't know how it was spelled. And if they'd asked the people, they'd been, the people would have been embarrassed anyway. They wouldn't have known their own name, how to spell their own name. So that's, you know, kind of the way that you have to be a little more careful when you have that. Um, as you find records and you find new names for the people, that's not uncommon. But the one thing that's not going to be, that that is not going to change are the places. If the places start get looking weird, then you've got a problem. You're really not in the right place. People can live in three or four different places at the same time. We do today, but that's not 
that's not was not normal and particularly back in the early days. Great. And William asked, what is the advantage of Jones genealogical research in 1972 over Google Maps? Um, I don't understand the question. So what are, what is the question? I, I think he's trying to say what, um, what, what's the um, advantage of using Jones genealogical research. Is that the book you're referring to? James? Oh, no, no. The genealogical research book, this book is basically says what I've been teaching this whole hour. It has it's nothing to do with maps other than the jurisdictional approach is basically the same thing. It says that places are absolutely important that unless you can have consistent places, your, your information is not correct. So that's the whole point of it. And, and Google Maps is the way to check how far apart places are. So if you, you'd run a, a situation like I gave that you have a family where, where part of the family was born in one place and you go through the children, they're all born in different places or they're all born in different. You go onto Google Maps and you say, put in all those places and see where they are and ask directions from place to place, which will tell you how far apart they are. If they're more than a six mile radius, that which has been, been found by extensive genealogical uh, research over the years, uh, going back in time, about six miles, people were born, died, and got married within a six mile radius of where they were born. That's the average. That's and be, anything beyond six miles begins to be suspect. Now today, of course, you people can get married halfway across the continent, but uh, back in the in the early 1800s, before the Industrial Revolution, that never happened because there just was very, very, very rare that anybody did that. Now, did they travel from England and immigrate to the United States and get married to someone in the, in, I mean, in the colonies, in the American colonies? The answer is, yeah, that could happen. But that's the kind of thing that you need to verify when you're looking at maps is how that happened. The question you always ask is, how did the mother get there to have the baby? And if that can't be answered, then, then the, the places have determined that the information you have in your family tree is probably wrong. Great. And Julie asked, would you suggest purchasing the book that you suggested at the beginning? Is it still useful today? Oh, yeah, it's very useful. I love it. Um, the question I do I say purchased it if you can find it it's nice I think you can probably get it for five bucks or two or three dollars it's not a rare book <laughs> I haven't looked recently because I have a copy so I don't look up to see whether it's available but it's the kind of thing where you can go on uh, on Amazon and put it in and they'll look at a lot of different booksellers and tell you if it's available if it comes up and they want seventy five dollars for a copy or a hundred dollars for a copy forget it there's all the information is available elsewhere, but it's just, it's just a very good source. Awesome. And Terrell asked if you could show the rules of genealogy again. Sure. There they are. Great. And Julie also asks, how do you transfer a family line from family search to ancestry and my heritage? Um, th that's the subject of other, of other um, webinars that we've done. But there is a connection between Ancestry and Family Search because they're they're Family Search partners. Ancestry is a Family Search partner, and when you go into Ancestry and put in some information, like you put in your name and your parents' names, then you can find those people on the Family Search family tree through Ancestry and import uh, your whole family line if you want to, which I wouldn't do. But you can, uh, uh, for any end of line on Ancestry, you can import four generations. If, you're, uh, if you have an LDS account, if you're a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, then you have a free partnership account with both Ancestry and MyHeritage, and that's where you can do the link between the programs. Otherwise, you're going to be on, on uh, MyHeritage, you can, uh, you can in, import as, uh, eight generations of your family search family tree information into MyHeritage which I would strongly recommend because then it gives you a lot of tools to start correcting all that information. 
but um, in both those cases, that's only available through the, the LDS account partnership with those companies. If you have, if you're not a member of the church and you have a subscription with Ancestry, then you're just basically back to the, what I've been doing for years. And that is just copying and pasting information over. Or because if it's in the family search family tree, unfortunately, there's no way, well, fortunately, there's no way to, to uh, export a GEDCOM file for most other programs, uh, you can export a JEDCOM file from from fam from uh, Ancestry or MyHeritage or or whatever, or you can if you have it in uh, uh, Roots Magic or Ancestral Quest or some other program like that, a desktop program, then you can export a JEDCOM file and up import it into Ancestry or MyHeritage or whichever. Those are all different ways of doing things, and they're kind of explained in more details in uh, all the webinars that we've done. Great. And it looks like that is all the questions for today. Okay. okay. Perfect. Thanks so much for presenting, James. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Let me get out of my stop share here. Awesome. Just a reminder to everyone about our webinar next week at the same time on Wednesday at 5.30 p.m., Research Walkthrough Best Practices for Adding a Family from England to Family Tree. And that will be with Catherine Grant, so we hope you are all able to join us um, next week um, on the 21st. And thanks once again, James, for presenting. Okay, we'll see you. Awesome. Bye. Have a great day.